Well, we're very privileged to have Leila Alcaldi with us this morning. Um, she is, let me just spotlight Leila. She is going to um, present on the social and therapeutic gardening scene in Spain. Leila is a passionate horticultural therapist who moved to the UK in 2015 and immediately enrolled for the course at Coventry University. Since then, she's worked in Germany, Spain and the UK. She has co-founded the Spanish Association for Therapeutic Gardening and writes her own blog in Spanish called Vitamina Verde, which means green vitamin, roughly translated. It's my huge pleasure to pass you over to Leila now and she's going to share her screen and presentation with us. Hello and welcome everyone. I'm going to share my screen now. Can you see it now? Great. So welcome everyone. I'm grateful to be here today. These wonderful ladies from Trellis, they've spent the last weeks preparing this beautiful seminar. Um, I think we are all enjoying and uh, we are, we want just to thank them to invite us uh, or invite me as a representative of the Spanish Association. I hope you have a great time now hearing about social and therapeutic horticulture in Spain. My name is Leila and I come from northwest of Spain and I come from a region that is very rural and it has a lot of nature around. We have the sea, we have the mountains, we have the hills and, and that's where my passion about nature started. I have studied horticulture back in Spain. I finished my degree in 2005. And I remember in one of the landscaping classes, the, the teacher uh, talked about designing a garden for a uh, visually impaired people. And that was, as we say in Spanish, that was the click on my mind. And then I discovered that you can design gardens for social purposes. Um, so, since then, it was just on my mind uh, trying to find where I could be trained on this field. Uh, we didn't have any training in Spain uh, by then in 2005. And then I have the chance to come to the UK in 2015. And I, I moved in August and in September, I was at Coventry University. So you can see how passionate I was just to start on this field as soon as possible. I have worked in Spain. I have trained a group of people uh, with learning disabilities, uh, which age was around 30 years old and they were all unemployed. Um, so we try to uh, teach them or train them in uh, gardening activities and horticulture activities um, in order for them to have more opportunities or more chances to find a job in the agriculture sector. In 2019, I went to live for a year in Hamburg, in Germany, where I have the chance to work in a project um, which had two different gardens. And I have worked with refugees or people are in risk of social exclusion. Um, most of them, they were coming from the Middle East. And you can imagine how challenging is the life when you come to another country under the circumstances that they come. Um, so it was, I think it was great to build something together. So we developed a really nice garden around the social housing where they were living. It was quite important that in one of the gardens, uh, the social worker put a lot of effort and we, and some of the sessions, we ended up being 40 people between children um, and adults. Uh, so it was crazy, but we really have a good time. And the garden now looks very beautiful. We have brace beds, um, uh, also a, a small greenhouse. Um, they have built their own benches and they have their own beach. <laughs> they created like a sand area. 
uh, yeah, it's been lovely and it's it's very important to have um, a welcoming area, a welcoming garden um, e around the social housing that are usually deprived areas. So that was a really nice project. Um, here in the UK, I volunteered for two years at Garden Organic, uh, where I have the chance to work with children, with adults, with young people and el elderly people, um, and some of them who, who were in the earliest stage of dementia and Alzheimer. Um, after that, I worked for two years in a mental health hospital, a rehab unit. With, it was a male unit with people between 18 years old and 65 years old. I worked with them towards social inclusion and reducing a stigma. We have a really nice garden. We have a lovely greenhouse, raised beds. And we were also maintaining the area um, at the entrance of the hospital um, because some neighbors were, um, weren't happy at all um, how the entrance looked like. So we put a lot of effort on that. When I came back from Germany, it was a time when the pandemic situation started, but I was lucky to, um, in September, to start in a project here in London. When I, um, when Trellis uh, proposed me to, to present um, this webinar, this seminar today, I was thinking, what's the main difference between UK and Spain um, in terms of horticulture and gardening? Um, and I want to let you know a few, few things about Spain um, around this matter. So for the people who doesn't know, Spain is the red country on the map. We're missing the Canary Islands, but uh, you know they are farther south anyway. Um, Spain has the second largest proportion of land devoted to agriculture purposes in Europe. Spain is one of the largest producers of olives in the world, as well as tangerines, grapes, barley, oats, persimmon and almonds. And you're probably thinking now, this is not a seminar about agriculture. Sure, I agree with you, but I just want you to put you in context of why we don't have so much garden tradition in Spain. Until the 19th century, the majority of the gardens were promoted by very wealthy people, especially royalty and aristocracy. Sorry, this is the first time I pronounce this word. Um, so after that, after that century, social changes facilitated the creation of parks and public gardens. And you have to also think that we have a great influence of the weather. And we also live in very tall buildings. So these are the main reasons that we don't have so much tradition in gardening as you do here in the UK. Having said that, we have very beautiful historical parks and gardens. As you can see in those pictures, you can see on the right hand side, uh, a garden that is inside the Alhambra. And on the left hand side, you can see one of the typical patios in Andalusia. And for all of you that you haven't been in Cordoba, um, during May, there is a festival, a patio festival, and I entirely recommend that to you because it's amazing. You can visit about 40 different patios with different designs and it's very fresh being inside. So if you haven't the chance to be in there, I just recommend it to you. But even in the history, when we read about social and therapeutic horticulture, we can find reference about how healing gardens were used by then in Spain. And the aim for those gardens was for treating mental health, um, for treating people with mental health issues, as well as uh, training them 
into uh, the gardening profession. Unfortunately, most of those gardens neither exist or are in use for that purpose anymore. So social and therapeutic horticulture in Spain is not very well known. Therefore, we have created the Spanish Association. As you can see, our association is very young, but we have been very active for the last three years. We put a lot of effort in spreading the word. We want people to know how beneficial uh, is gardening and uh, how therapeutic it is for all of us. We participate in different forums and we also offer workshops. We think it's important to, um, for the general public to know uh, us and uh, for the authorities to get to know how beneficial gardening and horticulture is for people. During these three years, I, I, we were invited to participate in the 14th annual meeting about horticulture therapy in Germany. There, they have a national and an international association. And for those uh, that haven't been there, the meeting lasts a weekend. So we spend the entire weekend meeting another professionals, getting to know them, as well as participating in different talks and workshops. And there I have the opportunity to meet one of the speakers of this afternoon, Tamara, that she is from the French Association. So don't miss that chat. We also collaborate with universities because that's another thing we think is important that we offer courses, but uh, we also think that it's important that we are supported by the university. Last year, we were supported by Zaragoza's university and this year, we, uh, we are very happy that also the University of Barcelona wants to support us. Last year, uh, due to the pandemic situation, I also decided to contact another colleagues who are practitioners, but they live in another country and they speak the same language as me. After two weeks, uh, I, I had the chance to contact seven different practitioners from seven different countries. And we decided to have um, a public webinar and that lasted uh, six days. Um, we use social media because, as I said before, we want to spread the word. We face the same challenges. Um, social and therapeutic horticulture is not very well known in our countries. So that's the reason we, we came together and we share our knowledge using um, as I said, um, Facebook and Instagram. You have to bear in mind that English is a language barrier for more of the Spanish uh, speaker, uh, especially for those people who are living in Central and South America. Since these webinars happen, three congresses happened afterwards, one in Puerto Rico, another one in Argentina, and the last one in Colombia. We have, uh, from the Spanish Association, we have also published um, some articles for the Horticulture Therapy Institute. And now we want to start, a, one of our goals this year is to start a research with the university because we need more evidence base in our lang language. And this is not to repeat the same research uh, that has been done in English. This is just to find out what hasn't been researched and what can we uh, do in order to um, enrich this field more. Our goals are, so we offer uh, training, we offer three different courses. We have a short course that is about 12 hours. We have uh, an advanced course that lasts 40 hours, and the courses that we have at the university that last uh, 20 hours. We also offer tailored courses and training for projects which have specific needs. Most of them 
uh, they need a training in horticulture because the people who are leading these projects, they are uh, maybe occupational therapies or psychologists, and they don't have any knowledge about gardening or horticulture. The courses that we are offering them, they last around 30 hours. We also want to create a project network in the country, and it's very important to us to be in contact with another associations as we are in contact now with Trellis. On our trainings, we provide practical activities for a better understanding. We want people to build empathy. And that, that, uh, that picture on the left hand side, you can see there is a lady wearing uh, special glasses that they simulate um, a visual impairment. Um, so after one of our train trainings, Akira um, came to us and said, now I understand better what, which are the challenges of my clients. So we can see that our practical activities are helping people to build empathy and understand better. One of the mandatory units that we have in, on our training is uh, we focus in sharing all the adapted tools that are now in the market. We also focus our sessions we projects we have been supporting for a year. Um, when we met them, they said they they have been trying for three different years to have a, to have a horticulture activity, but they have never succeed succeed. So the first thing we have done with the with the with this training, it was uh, to uh, provide them with an intensive horticulture training. Then we plan together, then we designed together an annual plan. We also designed together how the vegetable, um, sorry, how the vegetable garden was going to look like. And, um, that's the reason that I say we, we have vegetable gardens or allotments. We don't have gardens at all. <laughs> um, so we designed the vegetable garden with them. We designed the annual plan, and then we designed together a tool for measuring the outcomes, because this is the other challenge. The occupational therapies and psychology, sometimes they don't know how to measure the outcomes using horticulture. After a year, we make sure that they have the skills to carry on alone. Otherwise, they know they can reach us anytime. Even though uh, we call them regularly to find out if they need some support and, um, and to share with us their progress. One of our members is, um, is this um, company here is uh, Jardines Terapeuticos Palm, Palm Love, and that's a company that designs therapy gardens in Spain. Karin, she is from Sweden, and she is a landscaper. She went to, um, she has been living in Spain for so many years, and she speaks very, very good Spanish. Um, because she had, uh, she really wanted to design therapy therapy gardens she went to she went back to her country to Alnarp I hope I pronounce it on the right way and uh, to learn about rehabilitation gardens and the methodology they are using over there so Karin brought her experience and knowledge back to Spain and she's one of the tutors of our courses um, um, we use uh, this therapy garden as part of our training. So 
we think it's um, so people have a better understanding when they can see something that has been put it in place. In these gardens, um, so sorry, <laughs> Karin, she has designed gardens in Spain, but also in Portugal, but mainly for care homes. But this garden that you can see in the picture, this is the first therapy garden for public use in Spain and is run for Karin's company. The aim is to offer an active aging for people who are uh, 55 years old and above. It is located in Madrid, but in one of the boroughs that uh, belongs to the Madrid area. They have a team where is Karin, who is the landscaper and who offer the horticulture sessions. They have two occupational therapies and they have one physiotherapist. They offer sessions um, across the week and they have also one person who is in charge of maintaining the garden and this person uh, has a learning disability. They have designed four different areas for different purposes. Across the week, they offer sessions focusing horticulture therapy, sensory stimulation, cognitive stimulation, connecting with the reminiscence and physical activities like yoga, for example. But I know they have more activities during the week. They get usually referrals from the council from the social services, but um, they have um, a couple of self-referrals as well. It's so very well known. They have been running for uh, two, three years that now everybody feels that this, this is part now of their lives. Until January 2020, um, they have had 200 clients attending regularly to their sessions and they have across the year, 700 clients that have participated on those sessions. We hope that in the future, we can see more councils uh, considering having a therapy garden in their councils. Coming back to the Spanish Association, um, when I moved uh, to the, in the UK in 2015, I found out difficult to find projects in England and I couldn't find any map. And I know Trellis has their own map and I think this is a great idea. And I'm seeing another associations deciding to have a map on their websites because this helps uh, projects to build, a, to build a network and it also helps professionals to find out what is going on in the country. So I started this project in 2016 and I uh, prepared a questionnaire that, help, uh, that could help us to understand the difficulties uh, as well as the progress that these uh, projects are having in Spain. We know they face different challenges so, um, so we need a big picture about what's the situation about social and therapeutic horticulture in Spain. And we also think this map will help to, uh, to help uh, to promote studies and research in, the, in this field. On that questionnaire, we gather information like the 82% of the projects who were asked think that they will benefit hiring a horticulture therapist. Only the 64 of the charities are offering horticulture as a main activity. But how people know about social and therapeutic horticulture before the association appeared? The 50% they learn through books or internet. Only six professionals we have been trained here in the UK Three of them we, we studied at Coventry University and another three studied the award that is offered by, by Thrive. The rest of the people, they just learn by doing. As you can see, 
uh, for the last five years, there is an increase of the number of, uh, of this uh, type of projects, of uh, projects that are focused in social and therapeutic horticulture. But there are projects that they, they have been running for more than 10 years. The usually outcomes that they want to achieve is social inclusion, finding a job, and just for the therapeutic uh, benefits of uh, being outside and being in contact with nature. And who are the professionals who are leading these projects? Usually social workers, occupational therapists, psychologists, horticulturists, or environmental technicians. The average of attendance are about 10 people per project. Um, 64 of the projects, they said that they are uh, goal setting orientated. The main groups are people with learning difficulties, with mental health issues, substance mis misuse and elderly people. It says here sessions are around one to four hours, but most of the projects, they don't offer sessions from Monday to Friday. So for example, last week I got in contact with one of the uh, charities and they told me they go twice per week and they go about three hours each day. So at the moment, there's not much consistency about these sessions. And this is another thing that we want to achieve. The 64% of these projects, they say that they have adapted the garden or the allotment for their client needs. But the, I think there is a misunderstanding about what is an adapted garden or an adapted allotment. So we have to also work on that. The garden produce, um, they usually uh, sell it or give it back to a food bank. And uh, because of the weather is very nice in Spain, the 82% of the sessions are happening across the year. Only in the coldest areas uh, in Spain, they don't offer sessions across the winter time. Few of them are equipped with greenhouses, a toilet, a meeting room, because we have to think that most of them are using allotments or um, vegetable gardens that sometimes are not part of the charity. They are not in the same place, so they have to go to another place. The Spanish Alliance that we have created, um, it's, it's growing up. Um, and we are becoming a reference for new professionals or, or OTs, psychologists, uh, psychiatrists or uh, doctors um, who are now interested in the use of nature, horticulture or gardening for uh, improving health and well-being. We have created a network. Uh, we are creating also a network between our universities because we want to offer a course um, in our universities that could be studied in any of our universities um, among all these countries that we are taking part of this alliance. We also want to uh, work together in having more studies and research in our language. And it is important that we do that together because um, Spain can do that the wrong, but I think it's very uh, it's good to be coordinated and help the and help the social and therapeutic horticulture field uh, on this uh, matter. Um, sorry, I forgot. Next April we we are celebrating uh, our Spanish week in social and therapeutic horticulture and we will have some webinars for free. So for those who speak Spanish and want to learn more about this, you're very welcome to take part. Thank you for having me today. And if you want to find us, this is the website of our association and you can find us on Facebook, Twitter and Instagram. Thank you, Leila.
That was great. I really enjoyed hearing about that. And it's so nice to hear that you have international connections too for the, the Spanish speaking diaspora. That's great. Um, so I noticed there were some parallels, of course, which you would expect that in the, even in the history of the therapeutic uses of gardening in Spain um, within mental health treatment facilities, and then the kind of um, the abandonment of that model for, for good reasons, but also losing the land that was associated with those hospitals. And um, really exciting to hear you hear you've had positive interest from the universities of Zaragoza and, and Barcelona too. That's lovely. And I'd like to talk to you more about that. Similar <laughs> target groups too. Um, but also some really interesting uh, contrast with the gardening culture, which I hadn't really thought about, and it makes a lot of sense, and the climate, of course, which we all think about and are very envious about here in the UK. <laughs> so that was lovely. Thank you so much. I'd like to invite um, a few of the questions now, if you've still got some energy and voice left. Yes. Um, <laughs> shall, we, shall we give you some of the questions that we've collected? Okay, Leila. Ellie is interested in working in Germany in the future. Which gardens in Germany did you work in? So I was living in Hamburg, so and I was working in in two neighborhoods. But this is not a charity. This was promoted by uh, the social worker that uh, um, specifically specifically working on those neighborhoods. So um, for that person, I will recommend to go to IGGT, and that's the International Association for Horticultural Therapy in Germany. And, there's, and they also have the National uh, Association. So um, I can share the link maybe later on. I can send to you the link so, and you can share with them if you want to. Thank you. John is, has got a question on the garden that you worked with, with the refugees. He's wondering what crops did you grow and were the crops associated with, your, with their home countries and did you then go on to cook with the crops? So basically they decide what they wanted to grow. Um, the crops were the normal ones, the mainstream ones that we also grow here in the UK, but in terms of herbs, they were choosing the ones that they are using for cooking. Great, thanks. And he had a follow up question also, and the crop growing knowledge that your immediate client group worked with, did they, did they share that further with their own community? Say again, sorry. Did the refugees, did they share their gardening knowledge with their wider community? Um, yes. Um, so as I said, some of the sessions, we ended up being 40 people. Um, some of them, they, they were living on the same building, but sometimes they didn't have the chance to meet together. So they were showing me how to grow different crops or herbs um, um, for which purposes they were using that and as well as they were sharing that with me then another person was coming and they were sharing this type of information. Great. Okay, um, moving on to the universities, um, a couple of questions there. How difficult was it to make connections with the universities and what support does the universities bring your association, your organization? So we are very lucky because our chair, she works at Zaragoza University. Um, so that's, we, we can say that's a quick link to the university, but uh, she's working in another faculty. So she went to the occupational therapy faculty and tried to uh, engage with the, the team and they are very keen to offer now um, another, um, um, oops. they're going to offer our course but at the same time they want to offer uh, um, a, a class, sorry, about um, maybe, I don't know, across the year of uh, X number of hours talking about um, nature-based intervention and in particular uh, horticulture and gardening. Oh fabulous, 
Great. And uh, with the Barcelona University, after our experience with Zaragoza University, um, our chair, that she is great. She went to she she met with uh, one of the teachers at uh, Barcelona University. This is again in the occupational therapy um, faculty. So they got in contact with she got in contact with them and she explained very well how good is social and therapeutic horticulture for health and well-being of people and they just immediately offer her a webinar that is uh, happening today and if that webinar that webinar succeed they will offer afterwards the course my gosh that's incredible fascinating thank you okay thank you um, John has another question for you, um, and it was, is there any more information available on the Alnar Garden, or can you share links to it that we can go and have a look at later? Of course, I can share, I can share with you some information about the restoration gardens that they have over there, but you can also find information on their own website, but I'm happy to share that link with you. Karin has also pasted it into the chat. So okay. There, the links very helpful. So she's here today. <laughs> Great, thank you. Okay, um, Sally has a question. She was just great, um, commenting that it was great to hear about the Social and Therapeutic Horticultural Association in Spain, um, and she was looking for what kind of advice would you offer for setting up an active association in the UK? Now, kind of a she, you know, trellis is is doing that. Um, and John has asked me to point out before you answer your question, um, the Chartered Institute of Horticulture are attempting to build up a UK wide network, but perhaps if you can give us some pointers on how you went about developing the Spanish Association would be helpful. So I don't know about your experience in trellis, but I can say from my experience building up the Spanish Association is taking so much effort. We are very passionate about what we do, but it takes a lot of time and effort and contact. And, and just um, most of that is that for free. So if we want to build up something here in the UK, we need people who are passionate and who want to work on the same uh, direction. Otherwise it's quite difficult. Yeah. That's my experience. Okay. Enthusiasm. Yeah. Enthusiasm. Um, and passion <laughs> and, and believing on what we are doing and uh, we are offering something back to the community that sometimes is not very well known. Okay, thank you. Jenny has a question and she would like to know what is your understanding or definition of an adapted garden? Okay, um, first of all we need a path that uh, has, um, um, there are some technical information about what is an adapted garden. So we need a wide path, I can't remember now the measures, uh, that is adapted for people using any uh, wheelchair or any aid that uh, it needs to, uh, for walking. As well as we need the raised beds. Uh, so sometimes people understand that having a plot or having an allotment, um, sometimes people can bend over and work so far, so far away from the hive. So we need raised beds, or we can use the uh, these chair, this type of chairs that they can sit down and work um, and use a telesco telescopic uh, tool. Um, so those are the main ideas. Um, some of these uh, allotments they don't have a place where to sit down for a while and rest, mm. um, being on the shade for a while. Um, they don't have any toilet. So um, that's part of my understanding about how uh, could be adapted in order to meet the needs of our clients. Great, super. Lots, lots to take in and lots, lots to consider. Nicola has a question. Um, can you share your methods for measuring outcomes, please? So um, we tend to work with these um, 
in Spain, we tend to work with these projects, trying to find out what outcomes they want to measure. Um, because if, uh, if there is an um, occupational therapies, it's just to know which tools uh, they are already using and trying to adapt those tools to the gardening sessions. So we want them to create their own tools when it's possible. Otherwise, if they don't have time, because sometimes that could happen, we encourage them to use the well-being um, tool just to check and see the impact that uh, horticulture and garden activities are having on their clients. Great, thank you. We're getting through them, Leila. We're nearly there. Um, I've got a question, another one from Jenny. Um, who funds the Spanish projects? Are they self-funded or? So the Spanish projects, are some of them, they are self-funded, but most of them are funded by public authorities or, uh, or public. Uh, um, we have uh, foundations. Uh, do you have that? Yeah, so we have foundations. So it's just to try to find out where the fundings are and, um, and they, they just need to apply for those. Okay. But the Spanish Association is self-founded through their trainings. Okay, that kind of partly answers my last question for the time being from Jo. She was wondering how supportive are the Spanish government of the association aims and do they give you financial support? So does Not the yet. Spanish... <laughs> Not yet, uh, because we are on a state that we need to grow up a bit more, uh, because at the moment we are, we can't reach the Spanish authorities. We need more time to build up uh, a huge community. Uh, so they are aware that there is a big interest on this field. Okay, so you're working in that, work in progress. We are. Excellent. Yes. Okay, Definitely. that's the last of um, the questions on the chat. There's lots of thank you very much. She's coming in to you, Leila. Um, Fiona, over to you. Thank you. Once again, thank you, Leila. That was really great. Um, I learned a lot and was inspired by your talk. And I know that many in the audience were. Um, so I'd like to invite everyone to just show their appreciation and using the reactions button or just some wild applause in your in your video um, screen. And um, thanks, Leila, that's clear everyone enjoyed that.